Today we're uh, in part four of a series called What to Do When Life Sucks. And like I said, in the previous three weeks, we've been talking about what to do when something's happened to you, when you've been pushed in a pit, when you've been sold into slavery like Joseph was, maybe not a literal slavery, but you feel in bondage to something because of maybe some past in your life. And today, uh, as we've been talking about Joseph, today we're flipping the script and talking about a man by the name of Jonah. Now let me just pause for a moment and say, uh, this is the first message in my life, 21 years of ministry that I've ever preached on Jonah. So it, you, you're, you're the guinea pigs. Um, but here's the reality. The reason I, I've, I've wrestled with this story for all of my life, because how many of y'all grew up in church? Go with me. We'll show our age here together. Uh, how many of y'all grew up in church with flannel board Jesus? Come on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Yes. The rest of you are like, what? Okay, let me kind of explain this to you because I realize we have some young people in the house. Literally, we were, uh, we were getting ready for our, um, our creative team and, and worship production. All the people were getting ready for service, and we have our team meeting, huddle, make sure everything's good. And there's a kid back there. I love this kid to death, 16 years old, uh, one of my buddies, one of my kids' buddies. And uh, uh, he, I, somebody said, it's dangerous because he's got his license now. And I said, uh, I said bro, how many wrecks you had in the last two weeks since you got your license? And he was like, um... He was thinking, and he said, I backed my car into a telephone pole, my truck into a telephone pole. The first day, I got my, my truck, and uh, everybody's laughing. And here's what he said. He said, but I didn't have a backup camera. And I thought to myself, oh. <laughs> so then I realized what we're really dealing with here um, is that if, you don't have, if, you, if you're complaining that you don't have a backup camera, you have no idea who Flannel Board Jesus is. So let me explain. <laughs> Flannel Board Jesus was, there was a thing called Sunday school back in the day. Come on. Thank God that went away. And, uh, and uh, so they would give you uh, cookies and Kool-Aid and amp you up for the service in hopes to stay awake for the preacher who was born. And uh, in Sunday school, they would do lessons on a quarterly, and then they would do flannel board Jesus. What is flannel board? There would be like this, a, this whatever this little thing is that holds this flannel graph thing, and they had all these characters from the Bible that would be Jesus, and, and, and then it would be Peter and John and James, and I get them all confused. I didn't know that I didn't know that the, the, the apostle John and John the Baptist were two different people. Come on, it's like we're, weird. It's like, what, what are we doing with all this stuff going on? I don't even know how to figure out this whole, and like Peter was Peter this week, but next week I was like, I'm pretty sure that was John last week. <laughs> and so they would tell the stories and move the characters to tell you the story of Jesus. And I was like, this is the most confusing thing in the world. Praise God for technology. That's what all I'm saying. But in that, there was a story that they always told. There were two stories that I struggle with the most. One was Noah and the ark. Hard to understand. And the other is Jonah and the whale, which is terrible theology because it's Jonah and a large fish. Y'all like, what? Somebody lied to me? Yeah, your Sunday school teacher lied to you. And so we don't know what kind of fish. It was a large sea creature of some sort. And to be honest with you, the reason this one was hard to me is because it seemed like it should be on a comic strip. It seemed like it should be a cartoon. And it seems so unreasonable. But so does the creation of the world. And so as I wrestle, I've wrestled with the story of Jonah because it just is like, mm, I don't know, like three days in the belly of a fish. That's just weird. And so I've wrestled with it. And so I want to kind of circle back and maybe uh, pull down some walls of people who would say, you know what? I'm with you. Uh, it's kind of a hard one to believe, especially when it was on a flannel grab and there's this big fish blowing through the thing. It was a whale and it was all jacked. I'm like, I don't even know. Come on. It's just like symbolism or is this real? Can I just tell you though that Jesus puts the story of Jonah on the same shelf of truth as the resurrection? And Paul, the apostle who's a follower of Jesus, after Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection, he has a conversion. He's writing to the whole New Testament. He actually says to you and to me is that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we're wasting our time. We should be not out in this cold. We should be snuggled up in our pajamas today, doing whatever we want to do, not giving our life to something. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, our faith is futile. We have no hope. There is no living hope if he didn't rise from the dead. And here's the thing that I want to encourage you with today. No one, despite countless attempts, has ever been able to disprove the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. In fact, the evidence is overwhelming that he died under a man by the name of Pontius Pilate. He was put in a tomb. He was resurrected and he appeared to some 500 of his followers in the days following. 
many of them would give their life because they saw him alive. People died because they said, whoa, I'm following that man because he showed me the nail scars. He is alive. And so when somebody asks me or they ask you, how do you know? How do you know there was really an ark? How do you really know Jonah and the well happened? Here's my response. I don't, I don't know. But I know that Jesus believed it. And Jesus was raised from the dead, so I'm with him. And so once someone disproves the resurrection, which is not going to happen, the overwhelming evidence of a resurrection that Jesus was put in a tomb and he was resurrected from the dead, once somebody disproves that, then I'll stop believing it. But until then, that's where my faith lies. That's where my hope lies. And so we fast forward to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter number 12. Before we look at the story of Jonah, look at Matthew chapter number 12, and I want you to see what Jesus says about Jonah and this, this big fish. He says this in verse 38. Then some of the Pharisees, which were the religious people of the day who knew the Old Testament law, who knew the Old Testament teachings, who knew the Ten Commandments, said to Jesus, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Pause. I got a lot of side notes today, so you need to take a column of notes and then a column of side notes, all right? Because it's two totally different messages in the, in the same message. <laughs> side note here. Too many of our generation are asking God for a sign. And what Jesus is about to tell us is, I already gave you a sign. It's the resurrection. And he goes on to say, in verse 39, he answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign. But none will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, let me pause for a second here because we ask, I've heard pastors say, I asked God for a sign. And he told me, well, shame on you for asking God for a sign, pastor. I'm not saying you don't ask God to confirm something in your spirit. I don't, I'm not saying you don't ask God to give you peace about a decision. But God has given us everything we need already for life and godliness. We don't need signs to keep us a lot. See, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. And he says, but none will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. What is the sign of the prophet Jonah? He says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What is he saying? The sign that I'm going to give you is that I'm going to die on the cross for your sins and I'm going to be resurrected. That's the only sign you need. So as we look at Scripture and we start to wrestle with Scripture and Jesus says Jonah is a sign like the resurrection is a sign that God is real, then I'm going to put my trust and faith in what Jesus says. So he goes on to tell the story of what happened. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Meaning the men of Nineveh had a revival breakout because of Jonah, which we'll look at in a moment. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. What is he saying? Even the people which we'll look at were terrorists will even acknowledge Jesus. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation, verse 42, and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's teaching, and now something far greater than Solomon is here. What is Jesus saying? The resurrection. Everything hinges on the resurrection. And the people in the story of Jonah, the people in the, the Ninevites that we're going to look at here in just a few moments, will see a, a, a miracle of God turn to God. And he's saying they will even buy into this resurrection because they've seen the goodness of God at work in their chaos. Now, let's unpack the story. Jesus said it. Jesus rose from the dead. Nobody's proven he has. And in fact, the overwhelming evidence proves that he does. So let's go with Jesus' words. Now, maybe some of our walls have come down and we can believe this story a little bit and we can unpack it. So the previous three weeks, we have learned that Joseph was trying to do his best. He was 17 years old. He gets a vision from God. He's trying to do his best. But despite his best efforts, he's thrown into a pit, sold into slavery some 20 years in this messy middle period before he sees the will of God and the plans of God come to fruition for his life. It is a pit that he did not make himself. But Jonah is different. Jonah, in Jonah chapter 2, verse 6, says this, But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. He says, you brought my life up from the pit. Now, this is a prayer that Jonah is praying because he realizes he needs God after his disobedience. This is a pit that is of his own making. Jonah 
put himself in a predicament. No one pushed him into it. He jumped into it. No one forced him into it. He chose to go there. But here's the story in the message of Jonah for us today. Even in a pit you've dug for yourself, God is still there. So today we're talking about Pit Happens Part 2 with a message really entitled, ready for this? Spit Happens. Come on, somebody. Because what happens is we're going to see in the story is that God uses this fish, throws him back up on the shore, and we see how the story unpacks. So let's look at four phases of the life and the story of Jonah. Here's the first phase. Jonah was disobedient. Jonah was disobedient. All of us can identify God comes to Jonah and speaks to Jonah. He's a prophet. He's there to preach the the gospel or the good news. Jesus hasn't lived and died yet. So this is prior to Jesus, but to to preach a message, to turn to God. But he's called to the Ninevites. The Ninevites are uh, the center, the capital of the Assyrian Empire at the time. To equate the Ninevites to what we may know of today, for those of you who were alive at 9-11, if you weren't, you can look back and hear and see and read. The terrorists flew Uh, planes into the towers and everybody in America for a few moments at least had this panic set in against a group of people going how could they hurt us in such a way some hated some rebelled Christians fought through their emotions and tried to say we have to love in spite of that but the Ninevites were the terrorists of their day and God says to Jonah I want you to go and preach to them But Jonah has felt the pain and the devastation from the horrific things that the Ninevites have done to the people. And now God is calling him to go to people whom he hated. He actually says, God, they should be judged. Why would you dare give them an opportunity to repent? Here's how the Ninevites did things. So in in American culture, if we go to war and a a, a soldier does something that's of honor, they'll get a medal. Not the Ninevites. The Ninevites actually cut off the lips and the ears and wore them as badges of the people they killed. They would stack up skulls outside of their homes and their living quarters to show, look, a a weird flex, come on, to show how powerful they are. And now Jonah, God says, go to Nineveh. Well, I'm thinking, not only do I hate them at that point, but I don't want to die. And he says, go to Nineveh and preach to them. And his, his response is, God, you need to judge them. And that is true. God God is a just God and God does judge, but God also loves them enough to send Jonah. Here's another side note for the other column here. God never acts in one of his attributes to the exclusion of another. You say, what do you, okay, that's okay. God is just, but God is also loving. Can he be just and loving at the same time? Absolutely. Can God say, if this, then this, and cast his judgment onto something, but still love you through the process? We see through the story of Jonah that God can love someone, even in spite of their disobedience, even in spite of they need to be judged, and in spite of the fact that they will be judged if things don't change, but he can still love them through the process. And the cross is a great example of this, isn't it? Jesus lives a sinless life. God loves humanity enough to put the wrath of our sin on Jesus back, nail it to a cross, turn his back on Jesus, his own son, because of the wrath, and he does it all because he loves you and me. And so we see that God can act in multiple... We can't do that, can we? We have a very difficult time understanding. Well, God, they need to be judged, but they also need to be loved. And so God comes to Jonah and says, I want you to go 500 miles east into Nineveh. Now let's just pause. 500 miles, y'all. I don't like to fly on a plane 500 miles. I don't like to ride in a car 500 miles. Jonah's got to go 500 at least miles, maybe further, on terrain, on camelback, on foot. on what? Five. So the journey there is painful enough. Then he's got to preach to people that he hates and hates him. And so instead of going to Nineveh, <laughs> Jonah says, bump that, turns and goes the other way to Joppa, where we know Tel Aviv is today. And his hopes is to get away from preaching to them. And now he gets on a boat heading in the opposite direction towards Spain, because he heard there's some good beaches there. And what he's doing, hear me, is he's running from the presence of God. Now, 
He hates the Ninevites so much that he's willing to run away from the presence of God. Side note number 12. God loves people you hate. In fact, in the heart of the believer, there shouldn't be hate. It doesn't mean we have disagreements. It doesn't mean we, don't, we have emotions we have to deal with. But we are called to love our enemies. That's not always easy. You say, I'm supposed to love the pedophile? I'm supposed to love the person who hurt me? I'm supposed to love the person who hurt my friend? I'm not saying you, you are required by God through this series, the first three weeks of this series, to work through those seasons, those situations, to talk to someone, to get to the point, we talked about it last week, where you can learn to forgive in spite of what is done to you. And that's not easy. You need to go back and listen to last week. So Jonah is disobedient. And here's the second thing. Jonah gets disciplined. This is fun, isn't it? Jonah gets on a boat, and now Jonah's facing a storm because God sends a storm. You know why God sends a storm? God sends a storm because he loves Jonah. What? See, what happens to us is we get in a storm, and we're mad at God for sending us a storm, and he said, you should be on dry land. I told you to go one way on dry land. You're the one that got in the open sea. Don't blame me for this storm. How could God allow this to happen to me? Sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, when you're 25 and you continue to make the same stupid decision over and over and over, or you're in your college years, come on somebody, sometimes you find yourself in a storm because you're on a boat you should have never been on. And God is so good that he will send a storm your way when you are heading somewhere you shouldn't be. (laughs) The problem is, Sometimes in the middle of the storm, sometimes in the middle of the pit, we have to begin to ask ourselves, God, what is it you're trying to get me to realize? And listen to me, the sooner you do that, the easier it'll be. And so now Jonah's on a boat with some sailors, and I love this part of the story. This is the funniest part of the story. They are praying to their idols. Now, let me just pause. All I can think about, do y'all remember Castaway? Do y'all remember Wilson? It says that they, they brought their idols on board with them. And now when things are going, they bring them on and they're praying to their idols, hoping that their idols will rescue them from the storm. And it ain't working. So if you ever wonder, just think about Wilson. They've carried this idol on. They're praying to a God and it's having no effect. Hear me. You don't need a God that you can carry. You need a God that can carry you. Now that some of y'all are clapping and others are like, all right, where's he going? Let me kind of make it clear. You don't need a God you can drink. You don't need a God you can snort. You don't need a God you can drive. You don't need a God you can spend. You don't need a God that's an object of your lust. Come on, somebody. You need a God that made the heavens and the earth. And too many of us have been carrying our gods on board saying, God, pacify my need. And God says, no, no, that ain't what feels the need inside. And so they're praying to their gods and they wake Jonah up and they're like, hey, yo, You got a God you can pray to? This is where it gets funny. So he tells him, he says, "Uh, well, about that. I I got this God thing going on, but he probably doesn't want to hear from me right now. And I don't really want to talk to him right now because I don't like the Ninevites. Last time I talked to him, it didn't go so well. And I'm supposed to be over there, but I'm here and I'm running. And it's funny because the sailors' reaction are like, bruh, why would you do that? No, I mean, that's not the way they said it, but that's what they said. It's comical to me. They're like, why would you, what are you talking about? He's like, my God's not an idol. My God's in heaven. He created the heavens and the earth, but it's kind of weird. And they're like, why would you do that? You should have listened to him. Another side note, it is tough when people who are far from God know how Christians ought to behave more than Christians know how to behave. We're going to stay here for a little while. Be kind and compassionate. Love one another. Just as Christ loved the church. No, I'm just going to blast you on social media. Care for the poor. Love the broken. You see? They're like, why would you, what kind of God, why you serve that kind of God? Show me. And Jonah is so stubborn that he says, you know what? Mm, I go pray to that God because I don't want to go to Nineveh. I'd rather you just throw me overboard. And they did. (laughs) This is great. 
And this is where the story does become believable, if you believe in a good God. God loves Jonah enough to not leave him alone in the seas to drown. So he prepares, the Bible says, a large sea creature to swallow him up and spend three days in the pit of this, the belly of this large fish. See, a good parent loves their child by disciplining them, not out of anger, but out of a calm place, wanting what's best for them. So I have a 10-year-old. He's the emotional one. Like he can't stand to do anything wrong. It breaks his heart. I did this with my oldest as well when he was younger, but my, my 10-year-old, I have to get down on one knee sometimes. And I have to say, hey, I'm sorry, but we can't keep acting this way. I love you enough to not allow you to continue going down this road. And it might feel small to you, but you'll build a character issue inside of you that'll lead you down a path you never intended to go. Because I want what's best for him. And so there's consequences that follow, but we do it out of a calm, loving place. Here's the third thing. Jonah prays and is delivered. This is the third phase. Here's the problem with this whole story, though. <laughs> um, he don't pray for like three days and three nights. Because that brother thinks he's going to live on sushi the rest of his life. It's, he done made up his mind. I can, I can handle it. I can live here the rest of my life. Dude's stubborn. I'll just, I'll just show God. Okay, you do that. How's that 14th relationship working out for you? How's that addiction? I mean, it's just this constant. We just going to show God. It's not maybe our intention. It's really, it's just a heart of stubbornness that we won't humble ourselves. And so finally... Finally, after three days, he prays this kind of prophetic prayer in Jonah chapter number two that actually is kind of proclaiming his freedom because it ain't happened yet. But he says in Jonah chapter number two, verse four, he said, I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. What is Jonah saying? He realizes he's unworthy. Maybe some of you feel that way. You feel unworthy. You're in a pit of your own making and you've been stubborn for not three days, but three years or 23 years. You knew better, but you did it anyway. You continue to do it anyway. And the hard part about this is you can't blame the devil. You did it. I did it. And Jonah says, I'll turn my face towards you, God. Because God had you, I, he turned and he's ran from the presence of God. And now he says, I'll turn my face back towards you. Listen to me. You can turn to God. No matter how far you have fallen, if you'll look again towards the face of God, he'll open up his arms and embrace you. But too many people out of their shame and out of their guilt. So let's take you back to my 10-year-old. I'm down on one knee. You know what I tell him? Hey. Because he wants to be like, damn tears you know it's bubbling up and I'll grab him by the chin I'll say hey look at me look at me I love you I love you more than you'll ever know and I'm not angry with you but I need you to hear something there's some things you don't know because I'm your dad and I've been through life you can't do this when they're 45 but when they're 10 but we're like the 10-year-old, and God knows so much more. He, he just want to put his head down out of shame and embarrassment. I'm, no, you pick your chin up, because I'm going to fight with you. I'm going to battle with you. I'm going to die for you if I have to. And that's what Jesus did for you. So turn back to God. Write this down. Just because you failed doesn't make you a failure. I love how the story picks up. Um, 
Jonah prays this prophetic prayer. God, God I believe it. I'm, I'm going to turn back to you. You're going you're gonna to rescue me from this pit. Verse 6. And then in verse 10, it says, And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah out to dry land. That's disgusting. That's where spit happens. But I love what happens in chapter 3. God just picks up the conversation with Jonah. Like none of that ever happened. There ain't no lecture. He's just like, all right, Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. And it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Dad, sometimes your kid don't need a 90-minute lecture. Sometimes he's, okay, you turn back. We got it. We're moving on. And then he just says, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. God treats it and treats him as if it's the first time they ever had the conversation. And Jonah's like, golly, man, I got to go clean up first. But I need you to hear something. It ain't like Jonah was spit up on the shores of Nineveh. No, 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 no. He still got to, he got to figure out where he's at. He can't go to his iPhone, put in the coordinates and figure out. I mean, they don't show his location on the map. You see where Jonah now has got to travel back. I mean, Sometimes fulfilling God's plan and purposes for your life is the delays we've caused. And so he comes to him like it's the first time he's ever had the conversation. This is what I love about Jesus. The Bible says if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. You see, God responds to you differently. Because you're his son, you're his daughter. So now Jonah obeys and he goes to Nineveh. He still ain't got the best attitude, but he preaches. And people's lives are changed. And a nation responds in revival to a message that Jonah didn't even want to preach. Can I just say something to you that I think will give you some freedom or maybe not? The Bible wastes very little energy on how we feel. Whether we feel like worshiping, whether we feel like giving, whether we feel like obeying, whether we feel like forgiving, we don't, we don't see God going, okay, well, let's talk about it. No, we see Jesus feeling everything we've ever felt, but doing the right thing anyway. Being abandoned and beaten and abused and in the Garden of Gethsemane, you want to see pain and agony and anxiety? He knows what he's about to go through. He's been rejected and hurt by his own people, the people that he came to save. And now he's about to go to a cross and he brings his disciples. He asks them to pray and he goes into the garden and he prays. And the Bible says this, that he had so much. I'm going to tell you what happened because there's a medical term here called hematohydrosis that falls into this. But what happens is Jesus goes into this garden and he is full of anxiety, full of stress because he is hurting. And he prays this prayer. God, Father in heaven, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. What does that mean? The Bible is very clear. If you look back at Moses and the Ten Commandments and how he made the people at the bottom of the mountain who lived on their feelings drink their punishment... He melted the idols down and put them in a drink, made them drink their punishment. That's painful. Jesus says, if it's possible, let this cup of punishment pass from me. What is he saying? All the sins of the world, Jesus is about to drink the punishment of. And then he says, that's what I feel. Let it pass from me. But not my will, but your will be done. You want to know how I know Jesus had anxiety and feelings that were overwhelming? Is because what happened is, if you look at the medical condition Jesus had, he's praying, he's praying, he's praying, and it says sweat like drops of blood poured from his face. You know what happened is his capillaries got so large from the stress and the anxiety that they were huge. They couldn't even, and then all of a sudden, when that anxiety released, blood begins to pour through your, your pores. And sweat like drops of blood fell from his forehead. Because in the middle of all of that, when he knew he was going to do the will of the Father, no matter how much pain it caused, it brought a peace that surpasses all understanding in the face of death itself. That's where the sweat like drops of blood came from. And then we say, well, I don't feel like it. <laughs> you see how superficial sometimes our faith is? Here's the fourth one. Jonah is later used by Jesus as an illustration.
Uh, the, the story of Jonah is kind of, you read chapter 4, and you're like, Jonah, why are you depressed, man? Jonah goes through this all emotional thing, and God's still trying to get him to realize some stuff. But the real picture of Jonah is not his depression and stuff that he's doing. The real picture is that Jesus is pointing to Jonah as a picture of the resurrection. Hear me. Your failure can become a picture of the resurrection in your own life. The world looks at you and says, I used to know. And there are people in this church, people are like, man, I knew you when you were 17. I knew you when you were 25. What happened? He said, God made some dead bones come back to life. That's what happened. I'll say it this way. Your biggest mistake can become your most powerful message. What's your story? Is it a resurrection story? Or is it a story of death carrying around your idols? Because Jonah should have died. Some of y'all should be dead, shouldn't you? Others of you, you're dead in your sin. Spiritual death. But what I've come to tell you today is that there's hope even in your failure. There's hope no matter how far you've ran. Doesn't matter who you are. See, Jonah ran the other way. He didn't even pretend. So, we're about to sing a song. There's another story in the New Testament that sheds a, a resurrection illustration. There's a man by the name of Lazarus who's a friend of Jesus. In fact, he's sick and he's ready to die. And his sisters, Mary and Martha, send a message. The one you love is sick. Jesus loved Lazarus. He said, all right, cool, I'll be there in a little while. <laughs> like two more days, he decides to go, and by the time he gets there, Lazarus is dead. And they're all mad, and Martha's shaking her finger at him. That's the way I see it happening. If you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. So Martha said, I'm not sure if she said it that way. And he said, no, no, what you don't understand is you wanted me to heal him, <laughs> but I'm about to resurrect him. And I think the same thing happens in all of our lives. We want God to pass, heal this, do that, do that. God, do it my way. And he says, no, I don't want to do something for you. I want to do something in you. I want to give you a spiritual awakening. So just like Jonah, just like Lazarus, just like Jesus died on the cross and was put in that tomb and on the third day was resurrected, you're dead in your sins and you're far from God because the Bible says death came through sin, but through Jesus Christ there comes a new life and an eternal life and a forgiveness of sin because the wages of sin is death, but, ready for this, but God. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're going to sing this song, and it's wordy, and it's new, and some of y'all don't know it. And that's okay. But I want you to hear the message of a resurrection story for you. And then about halfway through, I'm going to come out and I'm going to give two responses. So go ahead and don't leave yet. Heart and soul, stay with me. Don't leave yet. I'm going to give two responses. The first one is, I'm going to ask you if you're following Jesus with your life. And if you're not, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life and turn to him and follow him. And you say, if I ask you, are you following Jesus? You're like, eh, no, nope, you're not. Yeah, Tuesdays. I mean, no. Either you are, like I am, I'm giving my life. For, doesn't mean there's not struggles in this life. That's not what I'm saying. You're not perfect, but like I am passionate, or you're not. I'm not kind to married. You see? I'm either married or I'm not. I wish our culture could get that straight. We'll talk about that in a couple weeks. I'm either following Jesus or I'm not. I'm going to give you a chance to join with at least 15 other people who made that decision. And over 3,000 people made that decision in this church's history. And we're going to welcome you to the family of God. And the second thing we're going to do during that moment in the middle of the song is we're going to give all you say, you know what, Carl, I, I want to follow Jesus, but now i got some struggles. I'm carrying some idols right now. I need to lay them down. We're going to give you a chance to respond. I'm going to pray over you. And at the conclusion, some of y'all are going to go back to our prayer and care room, and you're going to get some help. You're going to have somebody tell you how to give you a, a scriptures to read this week and a devotional and put you on the right step. Some of you are going to sign up for baptism next week, and we're going to celebrate. Because God, listen, the enemy thought he had you. But Jesus said, uh-uh, I got another plan. I make dead things alive. So I'm asking you to stand to your feet. Come on, put your hands together for the goodness of God. Now, I want you to I'm going to pray over you right now. I know, isn't it funny? People can't clap and stand at the same time. People are like... All right, so let's focus for the next eight minutes. 
And let's go after God with our whole heart. Father, I pray right now, speak. Let your Holy Spirit do its work through the words of these songs and the, word, the lyrics of this song. And I pray transformation will begin to happen in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we go. I've already told you what this response time is going to be. In a moment, we're going to declare our freedom. But some of you, you're not, you're not following Jesus. You came in here searching. Maybe you've been coming for a while. Maybe you just kind of, you ran from God. And God's trying to get your attention. You're either serving him or you're not. In a moment, I'm going to give you a chance to recenter your life around the things of God and take a step and say, God, today I want you to forgive me my sins. Be Lord of my life. I want to follow you from this day forward. And then right after I do that, I'm going to give you a chance to respond for those of you who say, God, I just, man, I'm starting to carry some other idols. I, I got my idols or something I'm drinking, something I'm smoking, something I'm doing, some lust problems, some things. I'm trying to serve Jesus, but I got some things I'm carrying. And I want to get, I want you to have freedom today from those things. And then when we're done, some of you are going to go to the prayer and care room. And you're going to ask, hey, what, what do I need to read this week? How do I need to pray this week? I need to talk to somebody. And listen, if you make a decision to follow Jesus in a moment, I'm going to ask you to tell somebody this with you and have them go with you. Because listen, we want you to be a part of the family of God. And we want you to be in heaven with us one day. That's what it's all about. And so I'm asking you to close your eyes right now. When I say three, you're not following Jesus. You want to put your trust and your faith in Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection. A sinless life that took your sins upon his back, put them on a cross, put in a tomb, and was resurrected so that you can now have new life. He paid the punishment you should have paid. When nobody looking around, when I say three, come on, hands are already going up. One, two, three, all across this room. I see him, yeah, man. All different ages, all different stages. Come on, yeah, if you're gonna do it, do it right. Let them know, put them up. Come on, hold them up for me, a dozen hands at least. If you lifted your hands, just say these words to God. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross and you confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, made new in Jesus' name. Would you whisper these words to God? Dear God, I come to you right now. And I thank you for sending Jesus to live a sinless life and to die on a cross for my sins and to be resurrected. I pray you would resurrect my dead life. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you from this day forward, to turn from my past and do my best to honor you. Today I call you my Savior and I call you my Lord. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, for the rest of you, you got some stuff that you're carrying. Come on, nobody's looking around. You got some stuff that's distracting you from following God. You're trying, but it's not working out. You're battling. Come on, lift your hands to God. Surrender it right now. Dozens of people. You're running. You're doing your own thing. Father, right now, all across this room, I pray that you begin to bring freedom to people's lives. Those that need to take steps today to have a conversation that you give them the power to do so, but they would make the decision to lay down those things that they continue to trace, not try to serve two masters, but only to follow you. I pray as we sing this next moment of song, as we sing this idea that the enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said you are mine, that would be a proclamation over our lives, that we are yours and we wanna live for you and you alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Come on church, at least a dozen people made a decision to follow Christ, come on. Now listen, I saw hands of people that are by themselves, sitting with family, young, middle-aged, more seasoned, come on. Nobody's old. It doesn't matter where you're at. Welcome to the family of God. Now, we got people in our prayer and care room along the curve wall in the lobby. They wanna just pray for you and help you face Monday. Cause Monday's coming. And Monday's harder than Sunday. Unless you're a Falcons fan. Sundays are really difficult sometimes. We just wanna walk on this journey with you. Don't walk out of here without stopping by there. We have a, just a Bible reading plan to help you get started on something simple. And we just want to pray with you and talk with you, okay? A couple of things I'll come back and share right after we sing this. But I want you to proclaim these lines over your life that you live in victory because you are, you are not, you're not the enemies. You belong to God. Sing it with us as we sing it. Come on.